Hi, I am Ordinal Mangahas from Cabeo Neve Sia, Philippines. Join us and Cardinal Chito every Sunday on the World Exposed on Jescom TV. Magandang araw, ako po si Patrick Lumtong na Maribelles Bataan. Samahan niyo kami at si Cardinal Chito Tagle tuwing linggo sa The World Exposed sa Jescom TV. Hi, I am Richie Kausaren from Amadeo, Cavite, Philippines. Working here in Surabaya, Indonesia. Join us in Cardinal Chito every Sunday on The World Exposed Jescom TV. Friends, greetings of joy and peace. I trust that you are well. Please continue exposing the word with us every Sunday. Subscribe to Jazzcom TV, then watch and share the word exposed on your feed. Thank you. Ciao, mabuhay! You are watching The Word Exposed. Let us behold Jesus, the Word Incarnate, revealing Himself to us in the Sunday readings. We are on the 24th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And in today's Gospel, we will hear three familiar parables. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son. Each of these parables shows us the heart of God towards sinners. The shepherd would leave the 99 sheep behind to look for the one that was lost. The poor woman would sweep the whole house in search of her lost coin. The compassionate father would tirelessly wait for the return of his son so that he might embrace him again. And the good news, brothers and sisters, once the lost sheep has been located, once the lost coin has been found, once the lost son has returned, there will be much rejoicing. God celebrates our change of heart and our reunion with Him. This is why Jesus spoke and ate with the outcasts and the sinners of His time. And whenever a sinner repented, the angels of God rejoiced. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshipping it, sacrificing to it, and crying out, This is your God. O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked this people is, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power and with so strong a hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The Word of the Lord. I will Greatness of your compassion, wipe 
clean heart create for me, O God. And a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence and your Holy Spirit take not from A reading from the first letter of Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these, I am the foremost, but for that reason, I was mercifully treated so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the King of Ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Word of the Lord. Mercy and owning. Our readings for today clearly are about mercy, the mercy of God extended to sinners, including us. But we want to emphasize one important element of the mercy of God, and that is owning the sinner. This is a lesson to us. How do we own brothers and sisters who have hurt us. In the first reading, God shows his anger at Israel. And Moses was the recipient of God's anger. God tells Moses, hey, go back to your people. Go back to the people that you have led out of Egypt. Look at them. They have now created a new god, a molten calf, worshipping it and claiming that that is the god who had liberated them. And God seems to be telling Moses, 
you and your people, okay, I have nothing to do with them anymore. But you, you, Moses, I will create a new people for you. Okay, you see how the anger of God towards an ungrateful and unfaithful people manifested in dissociating himself from them. They are not his people. But Moses, the great intercessor, told God or even reminded God, but they are your people. You were the one who freed them from Egypt. They are your people. And you made a promise to their ancestors. So why, why destroy them? They are your own. And in the style of writing, you know, you see that God as though remembered, yes, they are my own. And mercy emerged from that. How can God destroy his own? St. Paul, in the second reading, you know, in his letter to Timothy, presents himself as a persecutor and a blasphemer, an enemy of the gospel of Jesus and of the followers of Jesus. But then, St. Paul rejoiced in the mercy of God, the patience of God shown to him. And how is it? God, in His mercy, aside from, uh, a, 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 instead of saying, let us remember this Saul, <laughs> he should not enter our circle. <laughs> he has been our enemy. He has hurt the name of the church. Let his, let his name never, never be counted among the followers of the gospel. But that was not the attitude of God. That was not the experience of St. Paul. Instead, St. Paul marveled at how he was incorporated into the ministry how he was brought in the apostleship of the church. Someone who knew that he should not belong. Someone who knew that he did not deserve to be counted among those who would be embraced now marvels at the mercy that has counted him as Jesus' own. My dear brothers and sisters, when you experience the mercy of God, please remember that God is assuring you, no matter what has happened, you are mine. You are my son. You are my daughter. You are my friend. Come. Will you want me to own you again? That's mercy. The Proclamation of the Holy Gospel According to Luke Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the lost one until he finds it. And when he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon his arrival home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, 
there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country, where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, Quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field, and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, and yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice, because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord Mercy and Owning this Sunday, we are blessed to be reminded of the mercy of God and how the mercy of God gives us hope. Hope to us sinners, hope to us whose past has not always been uh, good. And we're stressing the element of mercy by which God tells a sinner, someone who has lost his way 
you are mine, you are mine. In the first reading, Moses reminded God, who out of anger seems to have disowned Israel, you know, because of Israel's infidelity. Moses said, but they are your people. You were the one who liberated them. How could you destroy them? How could you leave them? And God relented of his anger and punishment. In the second reading, St. Paul recounts his story as a persecutor and blasphemer. But in God's mercy, he was brought in to the church as one of the followers of Christ and even one of the apostles ministering to many, many people in order to make Jesus known. And for St. Paul, that was a manifestation of the patience, of the mercy of God to someone like him who does not deserve such owning. What he probably deserved as, I don't know you. But here Jesus says, come, you are one of my friends. The Gospel is the 15th chapter of St. Luke, the three parables of mercy, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son, the lost son. And look, you know, look at how mercy was manifested in the three parables. In the parable of the lost sheep, you know, when the sheep was found, there, the, the, the owner invited his neighbors to a feast. Why? God. My sheep has been found. My sheep has been found. The second parable, the woman calls his neighbors for, to a feast to rejoice with her. Why? Because the coin that I have lost I have found. It is mine, and I lost it, and I found it, and my joy is complete. And the third parable, the merciful father, you know, welcoming the son, the lost son, who knew the consequence of his infidelity and his squandering of the wealth of the father. He said, I am no longer, no longer uh, fit to be called your son. So treat me as a servant. But the father said, no. Let us rejoice. My son, who was dead, is alive. And look at the attitude of the elder son, who lacked mercy. Listen, listen to his words, to his father. He said, no, I've been faithful to you. I have labored for you. I have slaved for you. But you have not huh, organized a party for me. And when your son, <laughs> your son, who wasted your wealth, you know, returned, you, you prepared a party for them. He seems to be saying, I have nothing to do with you anymore. But then the merciful father Address the elder son. My son, he said, your brother was lost and is found. The father seems to be telling the elder brother, don't talk that way. You belong to each other and you belong to me. That's how you will recover mercy for your lost brother. My dear brothers and sisters, this seems to be a, a, a very uh, simple thing, but we know from experience when we get hurt and we nurture the hurt, a time will come when our heart will be hardened and part of it, part of the hardness of heart is a change of vision. I no longer look at the person who has hurt me as part of who I am, as my own, as part of my friends, circle of friends, or even as a member of my family. 
And when that happens, I start losing my sense of compassion and mercy. A time might come when I hear a bad news about that person and my reaction would even be rejoicing. I told you so. You deserve it. But that is the wrong type of rejoicing. The mercy of God rejoices when someone lost, someone who has sinned, has returned. And it is not an insult to receive that person again. Why? Because that person is mine, my own. When we look at all the conflicts raging in the world, when we look at all the indifference and even the wars, the violence, killing uh, innocent people, children, and the poverty that keeps many mothers in tears, we say, where is the heart of humanity? We hope that we could learn from the message of the readings. Let us recover mercy by saying to each one, you are mine. The word has been exposed. Let us now fulfill it. We know the saying, tell me who your friends are and I will tell you who you are. I brought this up because today we are going to reflect on the friendship between St. Cornelius and St. Cyprian, whose feast we will celebrate on the 16th of September. St. Cornelius was Pope from 251 to 253 when the Roman emperors persecuted Christians. His papacy of two years was beset with difficulties. But what made the struggle more complicated was the conflict within the church. The controversy centered on the Christians who, because of persecution, apostatized or renounced their faith. If these people sought reconciliation with the church, should the church welcome them back? The priest and theologian Novation, who would be anti-Pope, said no, they should not be accepted again. But Cornelius, mindful of the gospel, said yes. He believed that the church should welcome back the Christians who had apostatized in the face of persecution, should they seek reconciliation and perform penance. Surely, Cornelius' heart was that of a pastor and shepherd, and the Council of Bishops affirmed his position on the controversy. Among those who supported Cornelius was his friend Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage. As a good friend and as a good Christian, Cyprian participated in healing the conflict caused by the differing views on the controversy. But you might ask, a Cardinal, was that not about politics and alliances? Let us read first what St. Cyprian thought about the unity within the Church. The friendship between the two saints was not based on a political strategy, but on their common faith. 
Let us remember the teachings of the risen Lord. The peace which he breathed on his disciples always involved giving and receiving forgiveness. If we are heirs of Christ, as St. Cyprian put it, we must then be lovers of peace. Why further ostracize fellow Christians who had failed in witnessing their faith in the face of persecution, but are now humbly finding their way back when we can re help restore and uh, help strengthen their faith by being channels of forgiveness and peace. We must heal the wounds that divide us and that distance us from one another instead of pointing fingers at each other, condemning each other, denying one another forgiveness and peace, the very gifts of the risen Lord. And as we see in Saints Cornelius and Cyprian, we must seek friendships that encourage and support us in doing what Jesus did, especially to sinners and outcasts. We will be blessed if we have friends like Cornelius and Cyprian. Saints Cornelius and Cyprian, pray for us. We have prepared reflection points for you. Please share them with your companions. The first point is, recall experiences when you dissociated yourself from people who have hurt you. Alalahanin mo ang mga karanasan na ikaw ay lumayo sa mga taong nakasakit sa iyo. The second point is, how can we continue seeing our own brother and sister or our own self in those who have hurt us. Paano natin mapapanatiling makakita ng kapatid o aking sarili sa taong nakasakit sa akin? Heavenly Father, you have blessed this humble program with a decade of mission on air. You have gifted it with the talents, hard work, and financial support of many generous people so that as your word is exposed, many more may know, love, and serve Jesus. Lord Jesus, be with us always, your production staff and partners, your viewers and benefactors, that we may not run out of courage, zeal, and charity in fulfilling our mission daily. And when our limitations and weaknesses surface, please ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to purify us and set our hearts on fire with renewed faith, hope, and love, so we may serve you for many more years to come. Amen. Friends, thank you for your company. We pray that the Word of God would find fulfillment in your life and His blessings be always upon you. And we hope you could be with us again next Sunday here on The Word Exposed.